everyone. <laughs> and thank you all for coming to the New Mexico Museum of Space History this morning. I see a lot of familiar faces, and I see a few new faces, and we're glad to have all of you. This morning we have a special guest speaker uh, from Virgin Galactic, and his name is Pete Nikolenko. Pete joined Virgin Galactic in January of 2014 as Chief Engineer for Operations. Then he moved on to the Director of Spaceline Engineering, and now he's the Director of Mission Operations. That includes integration of flight planning timelines and procedures, and coordination with maintenance, flight operations, branding and marketing, payloads, licensing, and other support elements. So Pete's got a lot on his plate. Uh, prior to joining Virgin Galactic, he had retired from NASA after nearly 24 years in support of the Space Shuttle Program and ground processing operations at Kennedy Space Center. He provided operations engineering and test leadership to 106 Space Shuttle missions, including three missions as launch director. Following the end of the Space Shuttle Program, Pete provided leadership of a new directorate startup for all aspects of new development program operations and engineering support in Florida and for space station logistics. He is a recipient of the NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal, the NASA Exceptional Service Medal, and multiple NASA and KSC Group Achievement Awards. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Pete Nikolenko. <laughs> well, welcome everybody, um, and it's really my honor and pleasure to visit and, and share a little bit about uh, who and what we are uh, with Virgin Galactic, and then certainly after, uh, after I share some presentation material, uh, we'll open it up for questions and answers, and if you want to talk further about what we do and, and our, I think, really super cool mission that's called uh, uh, Virgin Galactic. Uh, but I can also talk if you want to uh, ask any questions about some of my, my former NASA days as well. Uh, so anyway, without further ado, let me go ahead and get started. So the first thing I got to do is share you a really, really cool story about what and how and who Virgin Galactic is. Some of you may know a lot about what we are and who we are as a company, and some of you may not know anything at all about us. So I'll just assume that you don't know that much, and I'd like to just share this video first. Um, that was 1988 with Sir Richard Branson. The moon landing was the catalysting moment for me. I remember my dad taking me outside onto the village green, and we just looked up at the moon. I really did think that myself and many other young people would one day be able to go into space. I waited and I waited and waited for that opportunity, and it never came. They got me thinking. I went to the registry office and I registered the name Virgin Galactic Airways. It's a brilliant innovation story. The origins of spaceflight at the time, it was big government. The XPRIZE was a chance to turn that into a much more personal spaceflight experience. Spaceship One claimed the X Prize and proved the dream was possible. This was the first private venture to go to space, return safely, and do it again just two weeks later. And then from there, we just started expanding. We knew we wanted a bigger system. We wanted something that you could float about the cabin and actually experience zero gravity. Virgin Galactic offers the first real platform where we can actually open it up to make space for all of us. We build on the shoulders of giants, but we want to be that first baseline for Earth and actually deliver on that promise. We are changing the way humanity views space. We've taken the impossible and we're making it inevitable. I always want to celebrate the team on this. You need heart. You need the best minds. You need the best humans to work on programs like this. The sky's no longer the limit for us. This is an inflection point in human history. Two astronauts on a tiny television inspired a kid from England. Imagine what greatness can come from a generation seeing Earth from space. You're seeing your home planet. It's a real connection with the Earth. It grounds you and it feels timeless. I think in the 
the same way that I was inspired by the moon landing. Release, release, release. Fire. I really hope that there will be millions of kids all over the world who will be captivated and inspired about the possibility of them going to space one day. I'd love to go into space. I think there could be nothing nicer. So, if you're building a spacecraft, I'd love to come with you on it. So, what is our purpose for Virgin Galactic? And and we've really thought about it. And, and ultimately, it really is about opening space to change the world for good. And that's a pretty audacious goal. And, uh, but we really think that as we are evolving this plan and evolving this business, that we really hope to enable access to space, uh, ultimately for the masses. So we are, what are, we are the world's first commercial space line. So if you think airlines as airlines are to commercial air traffic and air transportation, we want to be the world's first space line and enable this really cool mission. We, don't, we also believe that space belongs to everyone, right? It's adventurous, audacious, and we want it to be for the curious. And we go up to look down. So one of the things that, I don't know if you've ever explored much about that, uh, but there is something that's known as the overview effect. And the overview effect is really about how, you know, we get so much into and around our local environment, but those, that, those who have traveled to space and they look down on our very fragile Earth, it just, it is so moving, and it just, it, for many people, it's, they've said that it's changed their whole perspective on life and humanity. And then finally, it's just that, it just shifts who we are, and it transforms, just, it may transform many of our beliefs. All right, so Virgin Galactic, what we're about as a company, we plan to transform that access to space in, in a couple of different ways. The first one is in this, personal space flight experience, and I'll get to that more in a moment, but then also in enabling and util utilizing the spaceship to perform research flights and support academic and other institutions in science experiments and just exposing their certain uh, activities to the edge of space and microgravity. So just for a, a bit of a historical background, you saw a little bit of that in, the, in some snippets of that video that I just shared with you. We were set up as a company, began in 2004, uh, after um, a company um, known as Scale Composites won the Ansari X Prize. They basically uh, built a, a smaller version of what is our space flight system and, and flew a pilot to the edge of space and then turned the vehicle around and flew back again within two weeks. And that was the, the essence of that, uh, uh, that X Prize. We have two areas of business currently. Virgin Galactic, which I'll talk about, is about this suborbital <coughs> space flight for people and for research. And that includes what we're doing in manufacturing currently and flight tests. We have a, whoops, we have a sister company, excuse me, Never fails, does it? <laughs> I mean, don't you love those technical difficulties? Anyway, we have a sister company known as Virgin Orbit, and uh, Virgin Orbit uses a somewhat related uh, two-stage um, platform to deliver small satellites to low Earth orbit. And just talking a little bit more about that, we have uh, 1,200 or so teammates with several, uh, con several, actually now a couple hundred contractors. Uh, on our team. We plan to start what we are calling revenue flights, bringing up these future astronaut uh, customers uh, in regular service beginning next year in 2023. Uh, a lot of our manufacturing and test operations are performed uh, at facility, facilities in Mojave, California. We also have some offices and design locations in um, Orange County, California, and then certainly Spaceport America. And I'll go into that more in just a few moments. Um, from a first, we call it first mover markets. We have over 800 people now signed up to uh, support these uh, personal uh, passenger space flights. And we'll talk about the profile again in a minute. 
We also have contracts with and work with NASA and other researchers for flying certain science. We've flown uh, at least a couple of missions uh, previously where we've flown NASA uh, contracted science. And then our sister company, Virgin Orbit, also has that small satellite launch. They've been beginning their uh, commercial launch operations in earnest. So just to put this in context, over the course of our human history, only 631 people have ever been to space. Now, when we talk about space, that is the ed we're talking about suborbital space for Virgin Galactic. Just crossing the edge of that definition of space, have the ability to look down on upon the Earth and then land uh, at the same runway we took off from. Many of these other people that have been to space, and some been to them, you know, a very small number have been to the moon, and others to the um, International Space Station, and further into low Earth orbit. But when you think about it, only 631 people have been to space. All right, we have already signed up over 800 people from over 50 nations around the world to make a reservation to fly on one of our suborbital space flights. So, put that in context. Um, just to kind of show you a little bit of a map of our community, it's just, it's worldwide. Our, so just to put that in context, our chief pilot, uh, Dave McKay, is from Scotland. When he flew, and he's been to space now, is it two or three times, uh, on our uh, Virgin Galactic uh, Spaceship 2 Unity, he was the first astronaut who's been to space from Scotland. Hmm. And so when you think about it, there are many, many other, other people that you know, you can talk to some of the future astronaut community. Many of them want to experience space, not only to experience that overview effect, but some of them want to do that because, well, they want to be an astronaut, like mm -hmm. Sir Richard Branson had shared from back in 1988. So, uh, let me talk for a few moments about uh, Spaceship 2 Unity. And um, so when we fly our space, our space flight system profile, this is what it looks like as a graphic. Um, on the, let me see if I can show this, if I can get this thing working, another technical challenge. So, the, uh, we have a space flight system known as the, the Mothership is a, basically it's a specially designed uh, four engine carrier aircraft that will transport this, this spaceship into, it takes off from a runway, takes about 45 minutes to 50 minutes to get to a release altitude, and then we release the spaceship, which is that little thing in the middle in between uh, the, the pylons of the mothership. The spaceship then releases, the pilots ignite a hybrid rocket motor, which burns for about a minute, and the spaceship climbs up during this phase that we call boost while the rocket motor is igniting. But then after the boost, the engine shuts off and the spaceship continues to glide and coast to an apogee. As the spaceship slows down, we extend these twin booms that are known as the feather system, which basically acts, some kind of analogy is to like a, uh, a badminton shuttlecock. You know, when you hit a badminton, uh, uh, that shuttlecock, it, it can fly up kind of quick, but then it always comes back in a stable and, um, and slowed re-entry. And so that's what this uh, feather system, in fact, does. When we approach the apogee, the top of that profile, the pilot, uh, pilots then command the spaceship to basically turn upside down so that our future astronauts are able to look down upon the Earth. Right? You know, they can look out into space, but it looks pretty black. We want them to look down and enjoy the majesty of what uh, the, the, the Earth is like. And then the spaceship then begins its descent down. Um, we, during this period of time, there is about a three minute period of what we call microgravity, which is just, they, and we allow the, our, uh, our passengers to unbuckle and float about the cabin. Mm. So they'll have that period, about three minutes or so of weightlessness that they'll be able to experience besides looking out uh, the many windows on the, on the spaceship. But then we'll then begin coming back down and re-entering into the atmosphere and then uh, about 50,000-ish or so feet, we then defeather the, um, those twin booms and the spaceship acts as a glider and returns back to the, to the, and does a runway landing just like a regular plane. So that's the profile. What happened, uh, what happened to the thing that took it up initially? So that's, that's a great question. 
So that mothership, while the spaceship is executing this flight profile, the mothership is just orbiting around at about, oh, it, it varies in altitude, but they're just or, just flying around, basically waiting for the spaceship to execute its landing. So the spaceship lands on the runway. It takes about 10 or so minutes for our uh, technicians and crew to safe the, the spaceship, and then we tow it off the runway, and then that mothership, Eve, will then come back and land at the same runway. So, but that, that's a good question. Sorry, I didn't say it. I didn't mention that. All right, so. I may have missed it, but uh, the timeline from launch to uh, landing is? We're, it, it's roughly about two hours. Okay. It takes about, it, and, and the two hour period takes, it is about 45 to 55 minutes for the, for the mated pair to get to its release point and release altitude. And then the spaceship, that spaceship profile that I described is about a 20-ish, 25 minute uh, profile. And then following that, we also want, you know, need for the mothership to land as well. So from start to end, it's about two hours of change. Thank you. All right, so, so let's talk a little bit about our customer experience. So when a person who is a future astronaut comes on, we have and are developing a, a training regimen that we want to make sure that our, that our future astronaut customers can understand what to expect and then just be prepared to execute that flight. So on day one, they come in, we familiarize them, it's a welcome day. The day two is spending some time in what we call a mock-up, which is a full-scale mock-up of the, of the spaceship itself, just understanding and choreographing, well, where are you sitting? Which seat are you gonna be in? How to strap in and how to not only strap in and unbuckle, but how to get back in when it's time after you're done with your waitlist uh, period. Also, when you think about it, some customers may want to do nothing more than just look out the window and get that overview effect. I may want to, I may want to just do somersaults while I'm in weightlessness and just enjoy what that weightless experience is going to be like. So we need to and uh, choreograph, well, who's going to be at what location so that we're not having uh, our you know, customer passengers bumping into each other, so to speak, so we can understand and, and uh, choreograph that. Also, our intention, at least initially, is to have a, we'll have a cabin lead who will be assisting them, but in time, we expect that we will end up having um, just the passengers in the back. So we also need to train for them in the very, you know, uh, hopefully very remote chance of any kind of an, an incident or an emergency about what to possibly expect. So that relates into that rehearsal day, and then on the fourth day, we have the flight proper typically very early in the morning. Yes, sir? Is there any type of physical examination? Yes, there is. We have a flight, we have a flight doctor, and we do have some medical uh, uh, limitations, height, weight, and physical, you know, fitness uh, limitations. But I will say that the really interesting thing is that this is, we really do intend to open this up more for the, for the masses. So we do have some people already, I think the, I met the, one of our future astronaut customers who at the time was 81 years old, and he was, in, um, he was in a wheelchair. And so we want to try to enable and figure out how we can manage to try to make that work. I've also met our, one of our youngest customers who at the time, uh, she was 13, and her parents had bought a ticket for her. Now we mandate that the minimum age is 18, but uh, anyway, we want to try to open it up. And so there is a, there are some medical consultations with our uh, with our medical team as part of that process. Yes, sir. Now, how do people select? Is it a first come, first served on the two at the quarter of a minute, or what? That's a that is a very interesting question, and I think the best way to answer that is we're trying to sort that out, right? So we have it, it is it's an interesting one. It's not as though every person when they first uh, when they got a ticket that they got you know the, your number. 12 and your number 18 or whatever, we'll need to, we are trying to sort out how we're trying to work, we'll, we'll work that. Especially with those who are our, uh, the founding group of initial customers who purchased tickets well over 10 years or more ago, we want to enable that opportunity for, for that first group. So, excellent question. That's a, we still need to solve how that will be done. All right. So, this just, uh, wanted to show an interesting, this is one of those views of space 
hold that. I've got a video that actually will depict that even better here in a moment. This is just another interesting shot. This is a much older photo. This is not from one of our Virgin Galactic flights, but this is an older photo that just shows New Mexico from the edge of space. So one of the things that is interesting that we've already noted in our flight test program is that is that the pilots have noted that they can see roughly we're guessing about 1,000 miles in many different, you know, almost any type of direction. So you can see a lot from the edge of space where we'll go. Just uh, I had to put this in for a matter of context. To the, the left photo showed uh, Sir Richard Branson on one of a uh, training, one of those um, parabolic, parabolic uh, uh, zero gravity um, aircraft in training uh, some years ago, and the photo to the right is when we flew him uh, just over a year ago, uh, July 11th of last year, here at a spaceport. So I mentioned something about science. One of the other things that is uh, part of our uh, business base is an opportunity to fly some academics and other research, and so we can configure the um, uh, the inside of the spaceship to be able to carry racks of science. Some of the things that we've either flown or expected to fl uh, fly include some of the technology demonstration and other types of science uh, and experiments. We will work with the uh, pr principal investigators and work very closely with them to get, the f get their science and experiments into the spaceship, collect the data during the space flight, and then um, deliver the flow and experiments and their uh, uh, feedback and data back to the experimenters. All right, so where are we at now? I'm talking about where, you know, this is an operations team. We have not yet started our op full operations. We've been in test flight. We've, we're not only, uh, we started test flights of our Unity spaceship in 2016, and we've gone through a very graduated program of first mated pair test flights, then glide flights, and then rocket motor power and test flights. And that started in 2016. We have been to space four times with the spaceship Unity. Uh, Unity is, in fact, at our Spaceport America Gateway to Space facility right now, just a little ways from here. Uh, and, and we are preparing uh, a resumption of test flights for that spaceship. We plan to uh, complete that test flight period and start revenue service next year, 2023. So. All right, let me try this. I only messed it up the first time, but let's see if this will go. Okay. So this is that flight that we that took place last year, last July. So that's how it goes. The spaceship releases. Rocket motor ignites. Are you filming from the mothership? No, that is a, a, a long-range optical tracking oh. camera, not from the mothership. <coughs> that's from the that's a ground-based camera. Now that is a camera that is actually attached to the boom of the spaceship, and there's another one that's on the oh, next wow. right. Welcome to Oasis. You're clear to unstrap. So is that the size of an RV? How big is the space. It's roughly the equivalent of like a business. Before you get down there, I was once a child with a dream, looking up to the stars. Now I'm an adult in a spaceship with lots of other wonderful adults looking down from beautiful, beautiful Earth. To the next generation of dreamers, if we can do this, just imagine what you can do. <coughs> tell probably from some of the reference that the spaceship was just pirouetting to that upside down orientation. I think the seat belt's just kind of floating there. Uh, and that's only three minutes? Yes. Wow, but it's fast. <coughs> Where are the 
hide the special bags. <laughs> <laughs> we do have some of those, those Genesis bags, right? So seeing a lack of places to hold onto the wall, have you modified that? Y yes, th that's been that's an interesting question too. We've got some other handholds that are or around the windows uh, for hand grips, and then also can utilize the seats as well as part of that design. All right, so then we got a call from the pilots that say, okay, time to strap back in. It takes, you can tell, it would take a little bit of practice in choreography, right? <laughs> and what if they didn't get strapped in fast enough? We, that we are training for that as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much. But once it returns to the gravity, they can still just walk for this. Yeah. Right. And so let me, uh, we, so we were describing Spaceship to Unity, and that's the, uh, we are finishing up or wrapping up the flight test program for Unity. We have another spaceship, uh, it's, it's named Imagine. Uh, we're finishing with the completion of its build uh, currently, and then we will enter into flight test for that spaceship as well. And the plan is for that spaceship to complete the flight test program and begin revenue service about mid next year. It looks a little bit different from some of the, the livery. Uh, in fact, I think that'll be updated uh, here in time. Question on that last picture. Mm -hmm. On the front, it looked like it has a skid, not a wheel. It is. It's a skid. It is a, and, and it, that's a skid as part of the original design, um, and it is not, it really is intended for weight and weight savings. Uh, the pilots use differential braking, and they can to help uh, maneuver the spaceship uh, during the landing phase. All right, so. Uh, last video I want to show you is of our Spaceport America Gateway to Space facility. Um, Spaceport America is um, run and managed by New Mexico Spaceport Authority, and uh, I'd love to show you this video as well that describes. Okay. Oops. Gateway to Space facility, it looks pretty cool. And just a couple of related shots of when we had our uh, mothership Eve there, and we're housing it for some of uh, Eve's test flights. So and I'll, um, the interesting thing about this facility is that it is a hangar that was, it's purpose built to support our Virgin Galactic mission. It was designed originally to house two motherships and up to five spaceships. Uh, we're realizing that, well, we're probably going to need more space than that as we build our fleet in time. Uh, it's got a hangar in the middle area, and then we've got a customer-facing uh, section that's on the east side that has, uh, you can see a lot of kitchen and uh, coffee barista area and seating locations for not only employees but friends and family. Um, uh, lower left-hand photo uh, is of an area that's our operations uh, management area. And that right photo is uh, pretty much our walkway, uh, our hero's uh, walkway for, the, for our future astronauts. So when you think about it, we want to celebrate them not only coming out to and experiencing the space flight, but when they get done and complete the space flight and they offload and clean up and after the flight, that we want to celebrate that they have just been to space. And, we're, and we really want to maximize that experience. So, 
there are three levels in the gateway to space facility and the first level is called Gaia which means ground or kind of earth so it's got a lot of earthy tones and browns to it coincident with and matching the the New Mexico landscape the second level is called Cirrus which is like the sky so there's lots of whites and, cl and cloud like area that's also where we house our mission control center and where our flight operations and pilots team are uh, uh, reside and then the top level, which is our uh, future astronaut training area, is known as Astra. And it's going to have a lot of blacks and blues to celebrate the space uh, view. A couple of other shots just uh, while we had the spaceship and mothership uh, with the hangar doors open. Here's uh, the mothership Eve coming in at the conclusion of a, of a flight, coming in off the taxiway and onto the ramp. So that's our Spaceport America Gateway to Space facility. So, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, let me transition away and, you know, not only about our mission, but, you know, what's that mean? What is Virgin Galactic and what have we been able to do with and how do, what is the impact to our local area and the community? We have now have roughly about 200 teammates um, that support our facilities here in New Mexico that uh, live and work in the Las Cruces and even out in the border areas. Um, we also have regular visit visitors from our Mojave and uh, Orange County facilities as well as we prepare for flights. And we also expect to hire and have further uh, near term and future uh, hires of, of individuals. We have office space in Las Cruces and a warehouse as well in Las Cruces. So one of the things, and when you think about it, this is intended to be a huge inspiration you know, this whole notion of space, we really want to inspire, you know, the younger generations and generations of all sort, right, into how we do what we do. So we've got all sorts of different means by which we uh, uh, connect with, um, with all sorts of uh, teammates. We have a, a, something that we call Galactic Unite, which was very interesting, is that it was founded by one of our, uh, again, apologies, but... <laughs> All right. I'll I was going to ask you what, if that was your was okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right. So, and, you know, basically we do intend to be, you know, we want to be a part of the communities, right? Um, we also do and have a lot of outreach into the local communities as well. So I was referring to this Galactic Unite. We have something that we engage with uh, school kids, uh, usually at the elementary school age, but actually it's gone up to and through secondary and even at the university level, we have something we call space chats. And the space chat is really neat in that we do this internationally even, where we set up where we have a future astronaut, a Virgin Galactic and, and a Virgin Galactic employee, and we talk about our mission, what we're about. We have a question and answer session with, with, uh, with the uh, school kids, and it's just really, to me, it's really energizing. I, you know, I love it. So there's a lot of different types of outreach that we have here. Also, we do and talk and have scholarships, mentoring, and other forms of engagement uh, so that we can help inspire um, folks of, of all levels of, of age and um, backgrounds into how we can partner and collaborate. All right, so really this is interesting. I, I love the fact that you know Richard Branson as our founder and as part of the Virgin group of companies, he really is an innovator, I think. And he's done, it's been amazing that he and other entrepreneurs have helped establish this company with this vision about opening space and changing the world for good. So this was a photo, I, I, I love this, this was in 2016 when we literally rolled out that spaceship uh, to Unity in Mojave, California. So, and that was part of the group of we had. We just celebrated that. Richard Branson is here in the middle. I'm over here somewhere. Oh, there we go. So, um, we. It was really neat. It was just a really a great opportunity to just celebrate the rollout and that milestone of launching that spaceship. You know, and sharing it with the world. And then we try to celebrate each one of those milestones as we get to, uh, and experience them. So one of the things that's been part of the Virgin companies that I, I got to love as well is that, you know, life is a hell of a lot more fun if you say yes, right? Now, there are a lot of people who will tell you that, I don't, that seems pretty scary venture, and it can be. Space is hard, right? Space, 
it, you know, people, we have not been to space very much because it is difficult. It takes a lot of energy to get to space, but we think we really have a, an amazing uh, space flight system platform. We're trying to, we are demonstrating that it is safe and can be and will be repeatable. And we want to deliver this amazing uh, customer experience. And I think we will. So we, uh, there, basically at this point, we are, our operational location is Spaceport America here in New Mexico. We also have a, uh, from our Mojave, California facility is our, uh, another location for test flights, right? So we will perform some initial test flights for the Imagine spaceship. There, well, no, well, I'm sorry. We're going to bring Imagine here to New Mexico. We'll perform its flight test program from uh, Spaceport America. Uh, we will need to work on performing a couple of test flights with the EVE mothership because we're doing a modification and enhancement period currently. So we want to test, uh, test that out with uh, at least one flight before we bring the mothership back here to New Mexico. So one operational facility here at Spaceport, New Mexico. Now, if you fast forward some uh, hopefully short period of time, we expect to not only prove that we can operate effectively and just deliver this amazing mission and raise all sorts of interest with space flights, the suborbital space flights from Spaceport America, and then in time, maybe open up other spaceports around the world, right? So we've had some interest from some other countries uh, already to engage with us about possibly uh, developing, building, and then implementing um, additional spaceports at other locations. So, good question. All right. So, uh, that's it for this presentation. If anybody has any other questions, I love the questions that you have all asked so, so far. So, yes, sir. A uh, question on space, uh, Mothership Eve. Uh -huh. Is it equipped to carry passengers? Because I imagine it'd be a pretty cool ride for those of us that are probably not physically able or rich enough to take a actually go into orbital space. But that's a very interesting question. The short answer is no. Eve is not equipped to fly passengers. We have provisions to fly one flight test engineer with the two pilots in Eve. Uh, you'll see that, that you saw that it has two, looks like two, you know, uh, uh, Fuselages. Fuselage. Uh, the one fuselage is what holds our and contains our, um, our pilots and our command and control capability. The other one is just, uh, it's, it's just there. We don't pressurize it and it's just, it houses ballast pretty much. Yes, sir. Uh, I think the last mission, they got your rocket got out of its flight plan and got in trouble with the FAA. No, well, that's an interesting question. So, <laughs> no, 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 that was that's a really good that's a really good question. So, uh, we did we found that when we investigated, we had some uh, wind shear and some upper level winds that influenced a little bit of the of the flight profile and we had just a temporary excursion outside of the restricted airspace we've been working with the with the federal aviation administration in fact we meet with them regularly every week as a matter of fact uh, to not only work on and make sure that our launch license is updated but also that our airspace and the air traffic organizations are, are, are partnered so yeah we've uh, uh, we have much better understood what happened with that flight, and we're talking and working with them very closely. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Will it be possible to visit the spaceport like as a tourist destination, even if you're not a paid, you know, uh, so great point. passenger that's, or something? That's I think, you know, my guess is it's almost treated right now as like a military installation that you can't have, you know, anyone just wander in and that kind of stuff. But <laughs> that's a great question. Um, it is, uh, currently we do access and manage control to that gateway to space facility. We do, through the New Mexico Spa Spaceport Authority, does have a, um, a tourist concessionaire and a means by which through the through, through, through T or C, uh, they've got a, an operating platform by which you can do a paid tour of the Spaceport America facility. And that's but available that, now? That is currently oh, available, great. yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. Once the spaceship gets up there and comes down, how much maintenance, refurbishing, re whatever you, does it take before it's ready to go again? Is it, or is it like good to go? That's an awesome question. 
So and the short answer to that question is we are working very hard to refine our plans by which we can turn around that spaceship very quickly. Ultimately, as we build a fleet of spaceships, we intend to fly uh, up to ultimately 400 times per year. Right? Wow. Now, that takes more than one spaceship, mm -hmm. right? You know, with our spaceship um, Unity, currently based on our inspections and maintenance turnaround, we're expecting to fly that spaceship about once per month initially. The spaceship Imagine, which we are, uh, will be flying next year, we expect to fly that spaceship about twice a month. So those first two spaceships ultimately will be flying about three times per month. But then we are already in the process of doing design and development and partnering to build the next generation of spaceships and even uh, motherships. And in doing so, we intend to really rapidly turn around that, uh, that turnaround between flights. Well, the, the stuff, I don't know, I'm making all this up. Do you have to, um, like, replace heat shields? I don't even know if it has a heat shield. Do you have, do you have to replace windows or no, seals or? What gets beat up the most when it goes up there? So, that's, a, that's also a very interesting question. Uh, most of the, yeah, see, bonus <laughs> points. Uh, the only, the, from in a spaceship, the only major part or assembly that is, that is one time used only is the solid rocket motor portion of the propulsion system. That is one time use and we have to change that out each flight. The rest of the spaceship, really, we do not have to change out anything. It has, and in fact, that, that <coughs> feather system that you saw, you know, with articulating and in, 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 the, in the videos, um, it helps us to basically have and require just very little thermal protection on the, on the spaceship, which is really uh, very innovative. Actually, I mean, coming from the space shuttle program, we had 28,000, you know, space shuttle tiles that we had to inspect and replace hundreds of them every space shuttle flight, right? So it's a, it's a different model. Now, we're not going into low Earth orbit, but it is, you know, we're experiencing some, you know, some, and we have thermal sensors that we measure all over the spaceship as well to just check and make sure that we have issues or challenges during the flights. So, yes, sir? I was wondering if you might share with us how your career with NASA prepared you for something so interesting as this. So, thank you. That's an interesting question, too. So, when I started back in, uh, with NASA in 1990, um, I started as a vehicle operations engineer. And so, in that, I followed along uh, the spaceship orbiter uh, discovery from the time it was in orbiter processing facility, through the vehicle assembly building, then out to the launch pad, and then after the flight, when it came back, and we started all that over, and it was so it was an operations job, and I, and through my NASA experience, I worked from operations engineer to um, test director and launch and landing and all that human space flight ground processing. So. Back and when in, uh, around the time in what was it 2013 or so, uh, our company president Mike Moses, who's on that first uh, uh, video, uh, he invited me to consider coming to work for Virgin Galactic to try to leverage some of that ground processing and operations human space flight experience into what we're doing now, and that's exactly what I'm in about now. So mission operations is trying to bring those pieces of the puzzle together. We've got maintenance, we have engineering, the touch labor work on the spaceship and the mothership to get them ready, that's one piece. And the pilots and the flight operations and the airspace and all of those procedures is another. But then there's the customer piece, and we want to make sure that we're leveraging that. We have folks that focus on those different big important aspects of, the, of putting the mission together, but myself, my, my team and myself, our job is to try to bring those pieces together. So it's leveraging some of that. So, thank you. Yes, sir. What's the uh, planned life expectancy of your vehicles? So, that's also a good question. Uh, I believe it was on the order of something like 10 years and 2,500 flights, I believe. But don't hold me to that. I was just trying to remember 
how that, what the design intent was. And as we're trying to lay out the plans for the next generation of spaceships and motherships, we're trying to consider like the design life cycle as well. So, but it's intended to be for quite a period of time. That mothership Eve that you saw um, in portions of some of these video uh, videos, that mothership has thrown, uh, flown 300 flights already. So, just to give a, 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 some kind of order of magnitude comparison. So, yes ma'am. I have three questions if I might be so bold. <laughs> of course. Okay, so when um, when Unity is coming back in for a landing, is it a powered landing or is no, it No, it's a glider. So okay. after that rocket motor burns, um, that whole, that spaceship Unity is a glider. It's, uh, so, and now interesting, when you think about it, um, not only do we have traditional flight control systems that the pilots, you know, manage, you know, for, you know, basically pitch, roll, yaw, you know, all of that, uh, you know, in the atmosphere, but when we're in microgravity, we have to, we use a uh, compressed air and uh, a reaction control system to perform that pirouetting and attitude adjustments in microgravity. How much of that is automated and how much of it is actually being piloted? It's all, it is all pilot operated. Wow. Great. All pilot operated. So um, we do have um, uh, basically various other uh, system data and monitoring systems. Uh, and we have a, a rocket motor controller computer that watches all sorts of automated parameters on the rocket motor during that boost phase. But uh, the rest of all of that is all pilot, uh, pilot operated and managed. And we do have a supporting mission control center control room that have experts looking at different disciplines and we're having direct and live telemetry data and communications with the pilots throughout the entire mission. Okay. Go ahead. It makes me wonder how many of them have a glider pilot license. They all do. <laughs> they all do. We mandate that that's a requirement and they have to maintain currency in that. Okay, and um, great. Last question. When can the public come and watch one of these flights, and what would we see? Will we be able to see anything, or is it too high? Because I know you have a very small window of, of, of where you go. That's also another excellent question. Uh, I think, you know, it, it, it's interesting. I honestly do not know what our current plans are for enabling public access for viewing at Spaceport America. I think, and, and I can't recall based on how and what the weather conditions of the day are, you can probably say even see it from here during at least that boost phase. Um, I will tell you that um, I have not. I'm usually in the control room, so I'm not seeing what it's like out on the on the runway ramp. Um, but we have when our folks are, have been watching it, they said that they can pretty much see the majority of that profile. Certainly, the boost phase, and as we're coming in, you do also get a little bit of a sonic boom as we re-enter and get into the transonic regime oh, back yes, to, so inside of Mach 1. So, that's what we've been hearing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, good, que good question. And, and that's an interesting one. I don't know if you have more any... More information to come. You, yeah, I believe that there, there's going to be a lot more, I think, that we'll yeah. need to put out and to certainly engage. We want to engage with the, with, the, with the public and see how we can maximize that opportunity. So, good questions. Thank you. In the back, sir? Uh, yes, so I had a question. What would need to happen? I guess, what's the current plan uh, to move uh, from uh, suborbital flight into getting maybe customers into a low Earth or orbit, maybe like an elliptic elliptical orbit with a low eccentricity, maybe even circular if possible? Um, you know, is there kind of like, you know, what would need to happen both technically and logistically? We could spend days talking about that. Yeah, uh, so, uh, uh, high no, level. No, 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 I, I, I get it. I think it's interesting yeah. because you know this mission that we were talking about here is really just an up and down back to the same you know take off and land at the same runway from which we've taken off. There is a notion, and there are already companies that are trying to explore this point to point hypersonic travel that would take folks through the edge of space and. You know, it's a, a newer, much, much newer, and more, more advanced version of, say, what was like the Concorde from back in the 70s, right? So uh, I know that there are some companies that are exploring that that's not currently in our business base and looking to develop for Virgin Galactic. We really are at this point just about the, you know, uh, well, effectively up and down in that space tourism and just get that uh, overview effect in, the, uh, in that opportunity and experience. But I know that there is a lot of that that is already trying to be developed for point-to-point -point travel, and then there are certainly other 
uh, commercial organizations especially that are trying to explore that grand, uh, even grander version and different version to get out and either orbit the moon or either do some other uh, uh, longer duration space flight missions. There are actually even com companies that are looking at building and developing space hotels, right? So there's a lot of that that's taking place. So I gotta, let me reset this for just a second. Um, in speaking with uh, one of the groups at, uh, at uh, NMSU uh, a year or two ago, or a couple of years pre-COVID, pre it occurred to me in 1919 was the very first commercial airline flight. Mm -hmm. right? So in 2019, we had our 100th anniversary of the first commercial airline flight. So think about that. In just a little bit more than 100 years, we've gone from you know people who were paying big ticket prices just to go from like wherever it was, I'm trying to remember where it was in New Jersey to you know uh, Long Island, I think, or something like that. It was just a little hop in a commercial airline flight. So now millions of people are flying every day. And you're paying effectively, well, yeah, for some of us, it's kind of expensive, but don't airline tickets but so we intend I think and we'll see a transformation of access to space kind of akin to that commercial airline um, you know what, what is what, what we as a human race have seen over the past hundred years I expect that that will continue to grow and even further expand and you know we Virgin Galactic are about this primary mission um, we have some other you know there are other commercial companies and, and um, colleagues such as SpaceX, Blue Origin, Sierra Nevada Corporation, and others that are, Sierra Space and others, that are trying to develop access <coughs> of their own forms uh, into space. There is a very large, besides just in transforming space to change the world for good, we also see that there's an opportunity to make some money in doing it too as a commercial venture, right? So, all right, interesting questions. What else, Ms. Mary? Why is the time and space so short? And is it difficult to clear air traffic during the flight? Both excellent questions. So the first one is, is that the time and space is short in that we really want to just have enough energy to get to the edge of space and then come back and return down. It's a mass versus performance thing. So I think our, our Next spaceships will continue to give us, we, oh, I didn't really talk about it, but we will carry up to six passengers on a flight, right? So uh, when you consider the weight and what we can bring up, we want to just get to the edge of space and then come back down and not have to, you know, have other means to slow our descent and entry. So it's an interesting sweet spot about uh, where and how we limit that, that duration. So if you go too much, if you put too much energy in there, you don't want to get too far into that microgravity and find that without some other means to slow down, you have difficulty re-entering into the atmosphere. So, I'm sorry, what was the second question? Oh, is it difficult to clear air Oh, airspace. Traffic? Well, that's, that was the second excellent question. One of the biggest reasons why we have space, why Spaceport America is where it is physically located is that it really it adjoins to the White Sands Missile Range. And it is about the airspace. So the airspace and that airspace restriction, it's a, that's a permanent airspace. We don't fly in that airspace, but we have restricted airspace that abuts or adjoins that White Sands Missile Range airspace from basically zero to almost in, in infinity, I think is what they call, the, call that limitation. So for us, we pre-coordinate with the, with the air traffic organization from the FAA, and we get the, and we work the air clear, airspace clearances, but it's, we don't expect that to be any real issue, primarily because we have the, adjoined the White Sands Missile Ridge airspace. Yes, yes ma'am? What's the current price of a ticket? Go. Yeah. Another good question. So we started. Yeah. So we started. It, the, the ticket price started at two hundred thousand. The current price point is four hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a ticket. And we're going to have to evaluate that over time too, because we want to try to, you know, measure that and meter that so that you know we're trying to do this more effectively so we can make it relatively affordable, it's not quite affordable. You offer it's not quite affordable for most of us. You so. offer a, a senior group citizen. discount. <laughs> <laughs> senior citizen discount. <laughs> Maybe not yet, we'll need to talk to our astronaut sales team. I will tell you, it is interesting, um, 
a few years ago, I had the pleasure to meet a family that they, they chartered a flight. They bought six tickets for a flight, and uh, it was interesting to, to meet them. So there's all sorts wow. of folks, right? They so, oil. Yeah. So, yes, sir. so with that price increase, do the people who uh, paid the first 200 Thousand? Do they gotta pay more? No, no, in? no. But they, you know, they they bought in, and when those price points were set, so they're in. So in fact, there is a group that uh, that's known as the founders. It's basically the first 50 or so folks that bought in many years ago, and we're working to enable their, you know, first access. They'll be among the first groups of first individuals to fly. On a second note, on that, well, their tickets of. Uh, they pass away before they get to fly. Will their tickets go to their beneficiary? Or? I don't know. Those are questions. That's interesting, though. Those are aspects about how and how we fly that we do need to solve. And some of our teammates and leaders are trying to sort that out as part of what are known as conditions of carriage, right? So. Um, so we'll need, to, we'll need to understand those. I don't know where all of that is at currently because that's not in my, you know, wheel, wheelhouse, so to speak. But uh, but yeah, I know that folks are addressing that. So, uh, yes, ma'am? What's the waiting list as of right now? <coughs> well, we have over 800 signed up. So, you know, so far, they, you know, besides, you know, you saw that flight that we flew last year, July 11th. Um, and had Sir Richard Branson, we flew him on a test flight, and then the other <coughs> two folks were other, three other employees on our team. So we have not yet flown or started revenue service oh. yet, so we haven't even flown really passenger number one. And oh, by the way, Sir Richard Branson, him and his daughter Holly and son Sam, are they, they want to be among the you know first ones to fly in the revenue service flights. Yes, sir. It seems like some sort of auto, or autocratic company with Branson head. Is there a successor set up for him? Or? Yeah, so so interestingly, that's, that's a really good point. I mean, we have now transitioned. We're a public company. So uh, we have our, uh, our chief executive officer is Michael Colglazer. We have a board of directors. Richard is now, you know, he's got interest in, but he's not directly leading the company. Um, but we're still associated as part of the Virgin Group of companies. So is that, uh, did that kind of address what you're yeah. asking? Okay, yeah. very good. Yes, sir. All right. I'm just wondering, have you guys worked out with the state, our agree politicians trying to get money on taxes for your, when you do start picking paid passengers? That's also another question I do not know sure. the answer to. And I'm not well, part of <laughs> those thoughts. It's an interesting, it's an interesting question. I just don't know, really know the answer to that. We decided. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, what, for NASA, what percentage of knowledge of those spacecrafts was brought to Virgin Galactic's craft? Was it like 10%, 90%? <coughs> is it apples and oranges? Is I it think it's largely apples and oranges. There's a little bit we have. We do utilize some of what, uh, for, for some of that thermal protection, um, something that we utilize during the space shuttle program is called flexible, reusable surface insulation, frizzy or something. Um, but the other technology, I think by and large, it was not. You know, we utilize what, what we call a hybrid rocket motor, and it's hybrid because it's a combination of a solid fuel and a liquid oxidizer. Right. The nice part about that, the amazing part about that, is that. We, you could, we could turn it off or on at any time. I mean, when you turn it on, you can turn it off instantly. Now, back to my space shuttle program days, you had two solid rocket boosters, and then you had three space shuttle main engines. Two solid rocket boosters, when you started those on, you couldn't turn them off, right? So you could abort quickly. Yes. In fact, we did a test flight um, here, and uh, right after releasing the spaceship, like two seconds after the release, the solid rocket motor, or solid, the rocket motor controller, noted some parameter that didn't that was outside of its you know acceptable limits, and it shut down the rocket motor instantly. So we start and puff and stop, and then the pilots just all right, there we go. Then they just took it in, glided for the landing, and we had to investigate and understand what it was that <coughs> caused that that you know the reason why that uh, motor didn't burn as. Uh, uh, intended duration, but we we figured that out and sorted it out for the next flight. So, yes. All right. What other questions? 
Uh oh, yes, yeah, yes, ma'am. Sorry. That's all right. It's all good. I have a question. Like that's okay. It's all good. The guys that go up and fly the flight, the pilots. Yes. I assume there's always two. Yes. Okay. Are they the same critters, or do they have like? Get that all off, Joe. Or... So we have uh, seven pilots on our pilot corps, and we're looking to grow that team. Every one of the pilots are experienced test pilots, and they've flown in many, many different aircraft, and in, you know, uh, you know, high energy and other um, uh, uh, test and you know, uh, jet aircraft. Uh, one of our pilots is a former space shuttle astronaut, uh, CJ Starkow. So, um, so yeah, it's uh, they're very experienced, and we cycle the same cadre of pilots through. Um, there are two pilots in spaceship two pilots in mothership, one pilot usually in the Mission Control Center, and then one pilot is in what we call a chase aircraft that's just orbiting around a little two-seater aircraft and it's either, either using doing, usually doing videography, but then also just following it down and uh, chasing the, the uh, spaceship as it uh, executes the approach of maintenance. Yeah, oh yeah, we will, we'll need to. More pilots, yep. Yeah. pilot. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So, in fact, I, I, if not already, soon we'll be we'll be posting for some of the pilot positions. So, anyway, yes, ma'am. Uh, can you just go online and find out uh, if, like, when they're going to take off and land? So, interestingly, the short answer to that is no, not easily. And um, and one of the reasons why is that we're still in the flight test program, right? I think. Once we then do begin revenue service, it'll become a little bit more uh, consistent and apparent. And also, partly because as a public company, we have to be careful about showing, sharing what information we do about the flight schedule because that is considered currently as material, not public information. So, because you said you could see from here Alamogordo with the naked eye or with the telescope. I, that's a good question. I have not witnessed one or heard, talked to somebody who has witnessed a flight. I'm presuming that you may be able to watch it from here on a clear day, but I, I don't know if you know the answer and to that. I think you'd also have a little bit of advanced awareness. You'd have probably a few days at least if that it would be public knowledge that you would know. To be yeah, able to so look we, at it's, it's not like we, like we're trying to be yeah. that secretive about that just yet. It's just we're trying to sort through that uh, and help play out. And, and, and I hope in time we can do it and advertise it better. That's what I was accustomed to in our NASA, the NASA program days, right? So, I don't yeah. want to mistake it for UFO. Exactly. Cool. All right. Anything else? How we find it? Well, we're in, we're a public company, so we're we've got investors. Uh, we're traded on New York Stock Exchange. And so, and, and actually, we have a, a really good capital base, in fact, that will allow us to fly and get well established in commercial operations and then also to develop the next generation of spaceships and other ships. So, yes, well, thank you so much. It's thank been my pleasure. You. Hopefully, some of this has been at least informing. Apologies for my technical difficulties. As you can tell, I'm not, not that well versed in some of this stuff. But uh, thank you for bearing with me. At least I know I need a big.